I want to thank Cavalier as well and all of you for spending your afternoon here. I guess I'm the odd one out. Uh, the model I work with doesn't have a microbiome. Uh, it does have an intestine, and I'm going to tell you about how the intestine communicates with the nervous system. The other thing that's interesting about C. elegans is C. elegans grown in the laboratory lives on an agar dish with swimming with a lot of bacteria on it, and that animal does not have any microbiome. However, if you take C. elegans, move it into the soil where it's normally found, then it acquires microbiome, and then you can study those microbiome and all of those interactions. And we don't have a project on that yet, but we're thinking about doing that experiment. But uh, let, me, let me walk you through how uh, we stumbled across this question of what the gut is talking to the brain and how the signaling from the C. elegans intestine is changing neuronal signaling and neuronal be induced behaviors. So uh, before I begin, I want to introduce you to my lab. Here are students, postdocs, and research assistants who work, who I work with, and that I'm fortunate to work with. And the person who's highlighted is the one who's done this project. She's a graduate student in the UCSD biology program, and she recently graduated and works at a law firm right now. <laughs> so I guess the project went really well. <laughs> but so let's start off with an uh, introduction for this one. So I've been thinking about how to introduce this topic for a long time, and this is the best way i found to do that. So... <laughs> <laughs> Right? For those of you who haven't had lunch, you can sympathize. Training, focus, none of that stuff matters. So hunger has a pretty big effect on animal behavior. And we've been wondering about what that means and how does that actually affect behavior. How do you sense the lack of food? And how does the lack of food then communicate it with the nervous system, which then changes uh, animal behavior? So hunger, it turns out, has been studied quite well in different species. Here's a result from Jing Wang's lab at UCSD, where they looked at Drosophila larvae. So fed animals travel more, explore more. Starving animals do less. Uh, similarly, in mice, uh, neurons in the brain drive behavior uh, for regarding food intake, particularly AGRP-positive neurons. However, it turns out that apart from food intake, these neurons also drive other behaviors that we can discuss uh, at Q&A, if you like. And similarly, C. elegans behavior is also modified when you starve uh, C. elegans animals. However, despite all of this knowledge, very little is known about how you sense global food hunger, or global hunger, and then how do you relay that information across the different tissues? So this is kind of the paradigm that we've been thinking. So you have a brain that's sensing satiety signals, that communicating that information to different fat stores, intestine, and uh, energy store areas. And animal behavior is somewhere in the middle, which is getting input from all of these different places. Now, I'm not a super smart person, so I don't study complex animals. So the animal I study, is relatively simple. It only has 959 cells in the somatic uh, uh, lineage. It has 20 cells in the intestine, pretty small number. It has 95 body wall muscle cells, and it has two, 302 neurons. About 160 are up in the head. This is the intestine of the worm. Here is its, its germline. Here are two eggs that it has laid, head and tail. Relatively simple, easy to observe, and very easy to manipulate in this system. So the story I'm going to tell you is really got three parts. We're going to tell you how, now notice I switched from hunger and starvation to food deprivation because we don't really know what hunger means to C. elegans. We can't ask the worm that. But we're going to call it food deprivation because that we can do and we can time the duration that the animal spends out of food. We're going to show you a behavioral paradigm that we developed 
We're going to show you some of the molecular signals we identified that recognize that food is no longer present in the intestine and the communication between that and the brain. And we're going to show you how those signals change neuronal properties and uh, animal behavior. So here is our paradigm. So we start off by growing animals to adulthood. And then we transfer them to a plate that does not have food. We also have controls. And we're exposing both groups of animals to one behavioral assay. And the assay is a little bit tricky. So you put worms on one side, and you put a barrier of copper down the middle. And you ask these animals to cross the copper barrier to reach to the other side where they have a spot of an attractant. And the attractant we're choosing is popcorn butter, uh, <laughs> diacetyl. And this is, exact, this is what happens. So you have two videos that I'm going to show you. One on your left, which is a control that is well fed. And the one on your right has been starved for three hours. Now, three hours becomes important in a little while, but I'll point out when that is. But for now, you can look at what happens. So you can see these guys buzzing around a little bit. You have a copper barrier. They don't like the copper, even though they like the, they like the uh, diastole on the other side. Whereas animals that are starving, I hope you're noticing that many of them do cross that repellent barrier. So they, they seem to be ignoring this repellent and going on to the other side. Yes, no, should I play it again? OK. Um, we hope all of you are my reviewers for this paper, so yeah. it's super easy to get it through. Uh, but here's what happens, right? So it's pretty easy to quantify again. You just count the number of animals that cross that barrier. Now, when you have well-fed animals, you see that about 30, 40% of them will cross, whereas three-hour food-deprived animals uh, cross more frequently, and you have more proportion of these animals crossing. Now, this behavior is reversible, so you can take these animals, put them back on food, and now they will start to respect the copper barrier and not cross it as, as frequently as possible. Also, this, is, uh, this does not seem to affect fat stores. So fat in C. elegans has been measured by looking for deposition of a particular dye precipitate uh, called oil red O. And we have done that experiment, and we find that this food deprivation for three hours is not enough to change that uh, fat store in these animals. Okay? So we have a simple paradigm that sets this up. So you could wonder, well, what is actually going on? Are these guys becoming insensitive to copper, or are they becoming more attracted to the popcorn butter on the other end? And we can test that. So we said, well, let's see what happens. And we find that they become insensitive to, the, to copper whereas their sensitivity to the attractant remains pretty consistent. So what this food deprivation has done is changed the animal's uh, ability to detect the repellent, so which allowing them to probably take on a bigger risk, allowing them to travel in other places. Now, we also test a bunch, bunch of other repellents, and we find that food deprivation changes the avoidance that animals have to fructose, which is osmolarity for a cue, and to high salt, but doesn't seem to affect avoidance to every single repellent. So things like quinine and non-known are still uh, equally potent or equally repellent in food-deprived animals. Right? So you have a paradigm that seems to affect some circuits, doesn't affect other circuits, seem to primarily affect repellent sensitivity without affecting the attractants per se. So one question one could ask at this point was we said, well, what is this experience? What is food really telling these guys? Do you really need food in the intestine? Or is it just the smell of food or the absence of food that is affecting the behavior? So to do this experiment, what we did was we took E. coli, which are rod-shaped bacteria. But what you can do is treat them with a drug that prevents cell wall synthesis. And so these animals start to, these cells start divide, but then they elongate, which means that now C. elegans can be exposed to the smell of these bacteria, can probably touch and feel the bacteria. However, it can't ingest it, because this is too big for the worm to swallow and, and break it down. So when you do this experiment, you still see the change in the behavior, suggesting that perhaps what's happening is you need the, back, you need the food in the intestine for the behavior to remain normal. So in our, in our mind, we interpreted this result to say that 
uh, you needed a change in the internal state before the behavior to be modified. Otherwise, uh, the behavior wasn't uh, going to be changed. So uh, we did a whole bunch of other controls to kind of convince ourselves that is what is happening. Uh, so just to sum up this part, I showed you that the behavior is repellent specific, this three hour of food deprivation paradigm. It's reversible. Uh, it requires a change in the state of the animal. It requires the presence of bacteria or the absence of bacteria in the intestine that seems to modify the behavior. So then we, we switched around to say, well, how do you actually know that you have food or not have food in the intestine? So we tested a whole number of candidates and we hit upon um, one family of proteins, which is basically uh, the MCMAX family. And these are transcription factors. They are also glucose binding element response proteins. So in particular, Mondo binds glucose 6-phosphate goes off into the nucleus and turns on transcription from glucose response element binding proteins. So in the absence of glucose, you don't have glucose 6-phosphate, so Mondo sits around in the cytoplasm. So we can look at what is happening to Mondo's cellular localization as the animal is starving. So it turns out that well-fed animals have Mondo in the nucleus, whereas if you food deprive them for three hours, the same three hours that cause the behavior change, Mondo now heads out of the nucleus and heads into the cytoplasm. And so we think that presence of Mondo in the cytoplasm is sufficient to drive this behavior, and we have other experiments that can confirm that, is sufficient to drive this behavior change. So this particular protein is binding glucose 6-phosphate to turn on transcription, but we don't know what this protein does in the cytoplasm. And we looked at how this, how this um, the mutants in this protein affect behavior, and we find that mutants in Mondo don't uh, change their behavior or don't alter their response to the absence of food, whereas mutants in other members of this pathway do, suggesting that this is somewhat specific to that particular family member. So then we looked at where is Mondo acting, and this is the power of C. elegans genetics. We can turn on tran gene transcription in a particular tissue or a particular cell at any given time. We do this in the adult, and we find that we can turn on Mondo in the intestine, the body wall muscle, or in all of the neurons. And looks like Mondo tends to function primarily in the intestine, where it is perhaps acting to sense the lack of glucose, or glucose 6-phosphate in our case, uh, in the intestine. So I'm not going to walk you through all of this data, but basically what happens is that the intestine has a peptide release machinery components in the C. elegans, uh, in, in C. elegans, and the presence of Mondo in the, in, the, in the cytoplasm of the intestinal cells allows for the intestine to release peptides, which then act on the nervous system. So we turned around and we found the neurons where these peptides are acting. Now the one gap in our story is we don't really know what these peptides are, we think they are related to the insulin family of peptides because the tyrosine kinase insulin receptor present on sensory neurons seems to integrate this signal or is required for integrating this signal. We have tested 40 different insulins. C. elegans has 40 insulins. I know it's kind of a lot. But none of the single insulins, none of the single mutants have recapitulated the receptor phenotype. So either you have a combinatorial code or some other factor that is being released by the intestine upon detecting cytoplasmic mondo. But in the neurons, uh, you turn on non-canonical signaling. You basically use SGK1 and Richter, which is the uh, mTOR complex pathway. And downstream of this mTOR complex, you use a ER resident calcium channel. And the presence of that ER resident calcium channel is the downstream effector of all of this signaling pathway. So what, why am I telling you all of this story? So I'm telling you all of this because the ER resident calcium channel is going to change the calcium concentration in the neuron. So in the, in the absence of food, you have Mondo in the cytoplasm. Mondo then releases, helps in the release of these peptides. These peptides then activate the receptor on the neuron. The ne receptor then turns on all of this stuff, all of this downstream signaling cascade, and now you have greater calcium in the cell. Now if that was true, and if our model was right, we should be able to measure that. We should be able to see that change in calcium in that neuron when you food deprive these animals. And that's what we're gonna, we did next. And uh, we know that these neurons are sensory neurons. These are the ones that are detecting that copper barrier or the diacetyl 
uh, on the other end. And we know that of the neurons, three of them are known to detect copper. We looked at all three of these using our assay. And here um, we started off by looking at what the copper barrier actually looks like. So we used an indicator you can buy from Sigma. And this gives you a distribution of what the copper barrier looks like on the plate. It gives you a nice Gaussian distribution. So ideally, what you want to do is take the animal, expose it to that Gaussian distribution of copper, and see what happens to the pattern of activity you would see in the neuron. Right? You would predict that food-deprived animals would have more calcium because their ITR1 channels are open. And, uh, but unfortunately, in our setup, we can't actually show that Gaussian pattern. But instead, what we can do is give these pulses of copper. This is one second on, one second on, one second off, excuse me, of copper. And the way we do this is in our worm torture chamber, this is C. elegans being pushed into our microfluidic device. Stimulus copper here is moving away from the animal. You turn off this flow, turn this one on. Now copper comes to the, near, comes to the nose. And you can measure uh, calcium changes in the form of changes in genetically encoded GCAM fluorescence uh, as the animal is experiencing these pattern of copper pulses. Right? So um, I'm going to show you some data. Uh, for what this thing really looks like. Bright colors indicate fluorescence, so one of the neurons starts responding sooner. This is the neuron that we really care about. As copper comes on, it starts to fluctuate, and you can measure that fluorescence, and you can measure, quantify this thing pretty easily. So when we do this experiment and we quantify the experiment, this is what we find. We find that um, buffer has no changes in calcium concentration, which is good to have a control. Uh, the second thing we find is that well-fed animals uh, start responding to copper, but then they reach a certain peak, and after which they start to adapt away, and now their responses go down. Whereas food-deprived animals continue to respond to copper, even as you keep extending the pulses. And so this would tell us that you had more calcium in those cells, which is why they're continuing to respond, and they don't tend to adapt as quickly as the well-fed animal would have normally adapted. Now, we asked whether the tyrosine kinase receptor mutants are affected in this response, and they are in the tyrosine kinase receptor mutant, which also is defective in the behavior. They're also defective in the calcium responses. Food, def food deprivation is affecting both of those paradigms, confirming that these two are related to each other, and we're not studying something weird. So just to kind of sum up, what I want to show you is that ASI uh, activity, this particular neuron has been previously well studied. So, when you reduce this neuron's activity, we knew from previous experiments that you would get more turns, and when you turn, you're likely to avoid that copper barrier. Right? And this is what we think is happening in a well-fed animal. Now, when you food deprive the animal, you have more calcium in the cell going through all of that signaling pathway, and now this more calcium starts to give you greater responses, and this now means you have a neuron that is more active, which gives you fewer turns, and so now you're, you're less able to avoid the copper barrier, and so you cross that barrier to get across. This is what we think is happening as that animal is crossing the copper barrier. Okay? So this is kind of what I told you so far. So I told you that we have a behavior change. The behavior change is a reduction in sensitivity to repellent in, in when you de food deprive animals. Food deprivation is sensed by the C. elegans homologue of Mondo, Mondo then induces the release of peptides. Those peptides are sensed by DAF2 and the mTOR complex in, in the neurons. The mTOR complex then acts on an on a ER resident calcium channel, which changes the intracellular calcium concentration. A change in the calcium concentration then changes the adaptation rate of uh, ASI to copper, which then gives you the behavior change you're looking at uh, in, the, in the very beginning. Okay, so here's our take home message. The lack of food is sensed by Mondo, which translocates from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and induces release of peptides which act on the sensory neurons, making it from a copper-sensitive version to a copper-insensitive version, giving you the behavior that we looked at. Okay? So here are members in our labs, postdocs, graduate students, research assistants, and undergrads. Uh, I have a bunch of other projects that I didn't talk about, but we have a number of collaborators who help us with each of those projects. And people who currently give us money, and I'm happy to take more questions. <laughs>
I guess I'm ready to publish. <laughs> so, Not yet. Rusty has a question. Yeah, I, it doesn't escape our attention that this signaling pathway, DAF2, has also been implicated in aging as well. Yes. So how do you link this? Uh, and, and certainly food deprivation yeah. is linked to extended life expectancy, and these findings were originally discovered in the yeah. ceilings anyway. Can you tie it together for us? Right. So Rusty's bringing up an interesting point. Rusty says that he's, he's mentioning that you know, food deprivation or dietary restriction or the genetics of dietary restriction prolonging lifespan were originally discovered in C. elegans. Now, all of those dietary restriction experiments are done over multiple days. We're talking about an initial change in or a transient change in food deprivation, which interestingly uses the same receptor. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, has been, this has been a little bit of a bugaboo in C. elegans in the sense that we have 40 different insulin ligands. Yeah. We only have one tyrosine kinase receptor. And either we are missing a whole family of receptors that we don't know of, which is that these insulins are all acting on these different receptors, and we haven't seen those things. Mm -hmm. But there have been a number of studies now showing that these multiple receptors are all signaling through the same tyrosine kinase receptor. But they are differentially activating downstream signaling pathways. So for example, in the dietary restriction lifespan extension pathway, you turn on PI3 kinase and AKT downstream of the tyrosine kinase receptor. In our transient food deprivation experiment, you don't turn on PI3 kinase, you don't need AKT, you turn on SGK1 and mTOR. So there might be some selectivity in where these pathways can be turned on. Or there might be some control or temporal control or tissue control some about that. Yeah, temporal, some chronicity. Of right? how you would turn these things on. And prolonged deprivation perhaps switches you from a, yeah. from a SGK1 to a PI3 kinase dependent signaling event. Uh, we're kind of unsure about those, those pieces yet. Excellent. So um, just one more. Sure. Uh, so you, you alluded to at the beginning that that uh, they don't have a microbiome in the experimental settings that you're dealing with here. So could you explore a little bit how you're going to incorporate, now that you have this re great mechanistic understanding of yeah. how the gut is yeah. influencing brain rather dramatically yeah. and, and directly, yeah. how do you do this experiment? Do they do it single microbe at a time? No, so, so what we've done is uh, I have a collaborator who works at Harvey Mudd College. Mm -hmm. And they have a plot that they gave us. It's basically four feet by three feet. Uh, it's going to be sealed off. And we took some of our lab C. elegans and sent them over. And they're growing the C. elegans in the soil. And we're collecting our samples back. Mm -hmm. And every sample we get back, we start to see anywhere between four to 10 different species of microbes that are there. Um, and all of these microbe, in, microbe infested elegance. I don't know if it's an infection or if it is something. Probably naturally. Naturally. Right. They don't seem to have, a couple of them seem to have changes in lifespan uh, mm -hmm. by nature, but then many of them seem to have normal looking lifespan, except that they look a little bit healthier, they lay fewer eggs. Uh, so we're kind of still characterizing those things, and it's not been an uh, easy experiment to do no, for us. This is actually pretty exciting for the C. elegans field. Because exactly, because most now. Everything has been discovered in CNS behavior related things in the absence of a microbiome. Exactly. So now the question is when you bring these new animals in that, that have a microbiome, then what are you actually going to see? What kind of behaviors changes would you have? How have you changed the nervous system? What kind of signaling pathways have you turned on? So there's a lot of pieces on that that we need to figure out. Do they have the same classes that Rob told us about? The, the skin, the oral, the I don't. At the moment, all I can see is like intestine infections or intestine hosts. They're all being held in the intestine. Now, I don't know if other places can also be infected. Jonathan Hodgkin in the UK has been studying a bacteria that infects the anus of the C. elegans and stays there, and the animal can tolerate it for a long time and seems to host it. There are, there are other bacteria that will infect the vulva in C. elegans, but all of those seem to have deleterious effects on the animal. It's not clear if those infections will give you beneficial effects yet. In our experiment looks like there might be beneficial effects in terms of lifespan extension, at least for a few of those microbes. So 
we're kind of pursuing two different tracks there, right? So you can study infection, you can study host, host infection interactions, which I don't want to get into, but I really want to focus on things that are causing more beneficial stuff, because there you can get more mechanistic into it. That's terrific. Thanks very much. We look forward to the next installment. Thank you.